Iwo Jima, The Shadows of Suribachi, Gilberto Mendez, From the Mexican Army to the U.S. Marine Corps. Gilberto Gil Mendez was the youngest of 17 children, nine boys and eight girls, born to Sebastian and Maria Arroyo Mendez. His parents had fled Mexico during the Revolution of 1910, settling in San Antonio, Texas, where Gil was born. They were legal residents, he emphasized, and what they knew best was agriculture. Like many others who had fled from the Revolution, Gil's parents sought refuge across the border in Texas. So they settled down and they worked in seasonal agricultural crops, fruit and vegetables. They were the most abundant crops to be harvested. Although money was tight, Gil recalled that his family was exceptionally close. The older children were expected to work, while the younger siblings attended school. Growing up on the rural outskirts of San Antonio, Gil recalled that there were no hospitals, no clinics, no nothing, thus facilitating the use of natural remedies handed down through generations of Mexican tradition. Gil proudly recalled that each of his siblings were born at home with the assistance of a midwife. No doctors or fancy obstetrics needed. Unfortunately, when we came of age, said Gil, the depression had already started. This led to a severe backlash against Mexican immigrants living in the American Southwest. Known as the Mexican Repatriation, the U.S. government deported more than 80,000 Mexicans, many of whom were legal residents like the Mendez family. I was never able to comprehend how you can expatriate an American citizen. Gill and many of his siblings were, after all, American-born. We were repatriated to Mexico, but we were not citizens of Mexico. Gill claimed Mexican heritage, of course, but not Mexican citizenship. Yet, because his parents were Mexican-born, the Mendez family had no choice but to accept deportation. The government should never have sent us back to Mexico, he said. Following their forced repatriation, the Mendez family resettled in Michoacán. Gil eventually went to live with his uncle in Monterrey, where he continued his formal education until Mexico declared war on Germany in May 1942. Until then, Gil had never given much thought to Pearl Harbor. He saw it as a tragedy, to be sure, but it was an American problem. By this point, he had been living in Mexico for more than ten years, speaking mostly Spanish, and he thought that this new conflict would run its course without Mexico's involvement. Mexico was very sympathetic toward the Germans at first, said Gill, and prior to the war they did a lot of business with Germany. But when the Kriegsmarine started targeting Mexican ships on the high seas, the Mexican government promptly declared war on the Axis powers. When the Mexican president declared the war, Gill continued, they instituted conscription, or the draft. Gill was a few months shy of his 18th birthday, the minimum age for duty in the Mexican armed forces. They called it the 1924 class, which was the year that I was born. They drafted everybody that was 18, and they used the lottery system, which ultimately selected Gilberto Mendez as one of its earliest draftees. But his uncle was quick to say, You don't have to go because you are a United States citizen. It's up to you, but if you don't want to go, we'll go to the authorities here and we can go to the U.S. consulate and tell them the situation. Gill thought it over. Well, he said, everybody that was born in 1924 is volunteering to go. I think I'll go. After all, the designated term of service was only one year. Thus, Gilberto Méndez enlisted in the Mexican army. He was sent with his fellow conscripts to Jalisco, where they were issued their new equipment, uniforms and rifles. For new recruits, he said, we were embedded with the regular army, but we were separate. And at the end of his 90-day training cycle, Gill was promoted to the rank of second sergeant. The Mexican army only has two types of sergeants, he explained, second sergeant and a first sergeant. His designation as second sergeant put him in charge of the company's administrative functions. We stayed six months in Guadalajara, he said and we used to just drill all day long, took a break for lunch, 
and then in the evening we'd have at least two hours of lectures, tactics and classroom training. After six months in September 1942, we went to Mexico City in a convoy and participated in the parade on the 16th of September, Mexican Independence Day. After the parade, Gill's unit was sent to Queretaro. We went to stay at a convent that was part of a church taken over by Benito Juárez, the famous 1800s-era Mexican president, and we spent six months there doing the same thing that we did in Guadalajara, training, exercises, and classroom training. Gill was discharged on Christmas Day, 1942. It was an uneventful end to a seemingly uneventful conscription. Still, his brief service in the Mexican army taught him a lot about the fundamentals of military science. And the Mexican armed forces served with distinction during the war, most notably the 201st Fighter Squadron of the Mexican Air Force. Dubbed the Aztec Eagles, these P-47 pilots were attached to the U.S. 58th Fighter Group, flying some 96 combat missions over the Pacific. Meanwhile, back in the States, Gill's eldest sister received an interesting letter in the mail. She had been allowed to stay in Texas because she was already married to an American citizen. The draft board had gotten in touch with her, said Gill, asking for his whereabouts and demanding that he register for the draft. Well, he's in Mexico, she told them. He was deported with the rest of my family. But the draft board was clear. If he doesn't appear within 30 days, he is going to lose his citizenship. Gill and his family were dumbfounded. Despite being an American citizen by birth, the US government had cast him down to Mexico, and now they were threatening to revoke his citizenship if he didn't come back and register for the draft. Gill didn't know what to do. Did the US have any legal basis to revoke his citizenship? Or was it all a scar tactic? Going to his uncle, Gill said, I have to go back because I might lose my citizenship if I don't. The uncle, who was likely just as perplexed as his nephew, said, It's up to you. Whatever you want, I told your mother that I would help you. Thus, Gil Mendez returned to the US to accept conscription. He reported to the induction center on March 31, 1943. We were shipped to San Diego he said, where he and his comrades were given their options of service. His older brother, Vincent, had joined the Navy two years earlier and was serving as an aerial photographer. Try to get into the Navy, his brother told him. At that time, said Gill, it was supposedly the best branch of the service. Gill asked for naval service, but a Marine Corps gunnery sergeant quickly burst into the room. I need ten volunteers he said. You will be Navy personnel, but you will be in the Marine Corps, which is the infantry of the Navy, and you will be the fighting force, land, sea, and air, and you will be at the disposal of the President of the United States. The gunnery sergeant's dress blue uniform definitely added to the showmanship. This sounds pretty good, Gill thought to himself. So, I was one of those volunteers. Within the next few days, he reported to Camp Pendleton in San Diego for recruit training. As he described, marina recruits went through boot camp followed by line camp. Boot camp, of course, towered the fundamentals of warfare and military life. They just drilled you to death, he said. Line camp, however, was a more advanced level of training. Night patrols, simulated combat against dummies, interspersed with survival training, demolitions and anti-tank weapons. Gill found that his prior service in the Mexican army had prepared him well for the rigours of boot camp. Although the 1940s Mexican army was small, Gill remembered that they were tough and highly professional. They were very disciplined, he said. Thus, when he arrived at Camp Pendleton, I didn't suffer because I had the discipline already embedded in me from the Mexican army. After line camp, Gill and his fellow marines arrived in Hawaii. We continued more advanced training, night patrols and training manoeuvres with landing craft, the famous Higgins landing boats. From Hawaii they boarded a troop ship and route to whatever marine ground units would take them. We were replacements, he said. None of them had yet been assigned to a unit. 
We went as a nobody group, he continued, because, as replacements, we were here there wherever we were needed. Such was the life of a replacement. Indeed, a replacement was sent to any unit where a fellow Marine had been killed, and would literally replace that fallen comrade in the ranks of his unit. After a few days at sea, the troop carrier met up with an invasion convoy. Gil didn't know it at the time, but he was in the convoy headed for Iwo Jima. Hundreds of ships, he recalled. And on February 19, 1945, Gil could see the faint silhouette of the craggy island jutting up from the horizon. Now the Air Force and the Navy had bombarded that island for 19 consecutive days, day and night, he lamented, but they hadn't killed a thing. The Japanese had gone underground, determined to wait out the shelling. And now that the bombardment was over, the rising sun had emerged from their spider holes and were ready to return fire on the incoming task force. The convoy was under fire, but, as Gill recalled, we stayed on the ship because we were being held in reserve as replacements for the other units. Indeed, the first wave of Marines were expected to suffer heavy casualties, and they needed a steady stream of replacements to sustain the momentum of the attack. Still, most of the Allied commanders were anticipating a quick victory on Iwo Jima. We were told that the operation, the whole operation, would only take three to four days, Gill remembered. And then it turned out that it was 36 days of pure hell. But during the opening rounds of the battle, Gill was more concerned with being on a big ship than being on the beaches. The troop carriers presented bigger targets, and one well-placed shot from an onshore battery could take the ship and its marines to the bottom of the sea. When the first wave of Higgins' boats descended onto Iwo Jima, all hell broke loose, said Gill. From the deck of his troop carrier, miles offshore, Gill remembered. You could see the Higgins' boats receiving direct hits, going sky-high. That's when I got scared. For the next few days, he saw the muzzle flashes of American and Japanese forces flickering across the landscape, most of which were punctuated by violent explosions from the supporting artillery. He saw a glimmer of hope, however, on the fifth day of the battle. From the top of Mount Suribachi, the highest point on Iwo Jima, a group of marines raised the American flag. We saw it from the ship. Joe Rosenthal, an embedded photographer from the Associated Press, captured the moment in his iconic photograph, raising the flag on Iwo Jima. The photo itself came to represent the Pacific War and has since become a symbol of Marine Corps heritage. But for Gil Mendez, seeing the stars and stripes raised in real time was a thrill like none other. Your heart was beating a thousand times a minute, filling him with pride and even giving him goosebumps. After six days of waiting along the coastal waters, Gill's troop carrier finally began making its way to the shore. The beachhead had been secured, but even at D-Day plus six, Gil Mendez still did not have an assigned unit. As replacements, Gill and his friends wouldn't be sorted out until they made landfall. Wading off the Higgins boat, the new marines assembled onto the black volcanic sand. One by one, a personnel sergeant called names from a roll sheet, assigning each new replacement to a rifle company. When Gill answered to his name, he was directed to I Company, 23rd Marine Regiment, part of the 4th Marine Division. His first week in the 23rd Marines, however, was marked by feelings of dread. Statistically speaking, a GI stood the greatest chance of being killed during the first few months of his tour or the last few months of his tour. And Gil Mendez didn't want to fall on the wrong side of that statistic. In fact, he was so hypervigilant that he couldn't sleep. He was running on pure adrenaline. He refused to let go of his rifle, even while eating or using the latrine. I felt that if I dropped my rifle, I would be killed. For fear of lingering snipers, he often told himself, Gilberto, don't get up. Enemy snipers were, after all, a persistent threat, and they enjoyed taking aim at a GI's head. And I didn't sleep because of the stink of the blown-up bodies, bodies torn to pieces. 
Our mission was to take the main airfield, he said, the infamous Airfield One, and the Japanese were defending it with their customary fanaticism. Part of the airfield was guarded by an enormous bunker. We called it the meat grinder, said Gill, because it played hell on our troops. Indeed, a medley of Japanese mortars, machine guns and anti-tank guns wrought havoc on anyone trying to gain access to the airfield. They had everything they could throw, Gill added, and they had the advantage to be close. They were on the highest part of the hill. While moving forward to take the airfield, Gill's company was pinned down by heavy gunfire. We were pinned down, he said. For a number of hours we couldn't move, because every time somebody got up or exposed himself, he was gone. But during the opening rounds of this firefight, Gill had taken cover behind a thick slab of volcanic rock. It was an act of God, he said. Because the shape of the rock allowed him to prop his rifle into a good firing position, while still providing good cover from the enemy's counterfire. And, as it turned out, this rock would play a critical role in saving Gil's life. For within the next few hours, Gil Mendez would have his first encounter with a Japanese Banzai attack. It was about 70 a.m., and Gil remembered that there were about 20 of us, three infantry squads, pinned down along that section of the battlefield when we saw something glistening in the sunlight. Whatever it was, he could tell by its luster that it had a highly reflective surface. I thought it was a mirror, he said, because they had showed us in line camp how to communicate with a mirror, using the reflective sunlight to flash communiques in Morse code. But these flashes didn't resemble any type of naval code. In fact, they seemed erratic and almost panicky. That's when Gill realised it was no mirror, it was the blade of a samurai sword. A Japanese officer had emerged from one of the caves, rallying a group of wild-eyed soldiers behind him. And Gil could hear them shouting, Banzai! Banzai! By now, the bullets were flying in both directions, but Gil remained perfectly concealed behind his rock, ready to line up his first shot against the fanatical Bushido warriors. At that moment, the fear and nerves left him. All his focus was directed into picking off the Japanese troops one by one. I was shooting until I ran out of ammunition, he said. But rather than sprint back to the ammo point, I decided to crawl. And just as he had done during his first week on Iwo Jima, he told himself not to get up. Because I had seen the bodies with shots in the head, he recalled. They got up, they exposed themselves, and they were gone. The mantra continued as he shimmied on his belly. Don't get up, Gilberto, don't get up. He belly crawled over to two fellow marines on his left, asking for a bandolier. Each of them happily obliged, tossing Gil a single bandolier. Thus, with two full bandoliers, Gil crawled back to his rock, ready to take aim at the next wave of incoming troops. And here the Japanese kept on coming out of the cave. Kneeling back behind his rock, Gil drew a bead on a Japanese soldier who was slowly cresting a rise in the terrain. At first, all he could see was the helmet, but it soon morphed into the unmistakable visage of a Japanese infantryman. Aiming for his neck, I pulled the trigger pow, but surprisingly the enemy soldier didn't die. The bullet had only wounded him. Nearly a minute later, Gil was aghast to see this same soldier crawling up a rise in the terrain, trying to push himself forward. Without hesitation, Gil readied his rifle for another shot. Bang, 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 and the clip jumps up and out of the rifle. Gil reloaded just in time to see the Japanese soldier expire. They found thirteen holes in his body. Gil didn't know it at the time, but this was the same officer who had led the Banzai charge with his samurai sword. They found his sword right beside him. Anyway, they kept on coming, Gil continued. I stayed behind that rock ten hours. By the end of that firefight, however, Gil was credited with twenty confirmed kills. In total, the platoon had killed nearly seventy Japanese soldiers. But this battle for Iwo Jima was far from over. The following day, Gil recalled, we started moving out and all hell broke loose again. Mortar fire, machine gun fire, rifle fire... An anti-tank fire pelted the American positions. 
Of the enemy's ordnance, the anti-tank guns seemed to be the worst. Gill described the Japanese anti-tank guns as somewhat comparable to the US 37mm pieces deadly when used against armour or dismounts. One of the mortar shells landed pretty close to me, he said. I was lucky because they later told me that a large piece of shrapnel was embedded in my pick shovel on my back. So I could imagine, and anybody could imagine, had it not been for that shovel, it would have hit me probably somewhere in the spine. Still, the impact of the mortar had been close enough to knock Gill clear off his feet, and with a terrible ringing in my ear, my right ear. To make matters worse, the shockwave had disrupted Gill's equilibrium to the point that he was now choking on his own tongue. A corpsman and a fellow marine tried to pull his tongue out with a safety pin. They pierced my tongue and they were pulling my lip, he recalled, trying to get his tongue from becoming his own demise. Get up, they pleaded. But Gill couldn't even stand. For that matter, he could hardly hear. And that terrible ringing in my ear, he said. It took about six months after I was discharged to get rid of the thing. Deducing that Gill had no physical wounds, the corpsman and other marine hoisted Gill back to the field hospital. He had obviously sustained a concussion, but they had no idea how bad it may have been. Then a nurse came over, gave me a shot, I don't know what, but it knocked me out. When he woke up on February 28, 1945, he was on a hospital ship bound for Hawaii. We were dropped off in Maui, transferred to another ship, and came back to the US, to the Oakland Receiving Hospital. We stayed in Oakland just a short while, maybe a day or two. Then we joined in a convoy by bus, went from Oakland to San Diego. After a brief stay at Balboa Navy Hospital, Gilberto Mendez was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps in November 1945. Having served in combat while wearing the uniform of his American birthland, Gill was certain that no one could argue for a second deportation. In fact, he never understood the legality of why he and his parents had been deported the first time. He was, after all, an American citizen by birth. And although his parents were not citizens, they were, nevertheless, legal residents. But such was the nature of the great Mexican repatriation of the 1930s. All told, however, Gill had no desire to return to Mexico. In November 1945, he bought a bus ticket to San Antonio, where he remained for the rest of his life. When I was discharged, I spent about two, three days just making applications, he said. I made applications for every government installation that there was at the time. Lackland, Kelly, Fort Sam, Randolph, Brooks Army Hospital, everywhere, the post office, the VA. And the first one to call me for an interview was the post office, but they wanted me as a postal clerk. Gill wasn't impressed. No, he said, I want to be outside. I want to deliver the mail. Well, said the postmaster. We don't have a position available right now, but if you want postal clerk, you'll have a job. Gill stood his ground. No, I don't want to be inside. I like the outdoors. That's when he landed a job at Lackland Air Force Base. He remained a federal employee for the next several decades until his retirement. Reflecting on his service in both the Mexican Army and U.S. Marine Corps, Gill said, If I had to do it again, I would gladly do it. By the grace of God, I'm here, and I have four children. Three girls and my son and three out of four have worn a uniform of this country. I had a daughter in the army, my son in the navy, and my youngest daughter in the navy making a career out of her service. I think that I paid my ticket. Gilberto Mendez passed away on April 29, 2012, at the age of 87. He was buried with military honors at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery in San Antonio, Texas.